Hello, and welcome to the essay on Vulnerable by Design, the series in which we step back, pause, and reflect on the everyday objects that make us vulnerable. I am Chris on Rust. In today's episode, PowerPoint. Can you see my slides? I actually do hope not, because this is radio, so there aren't supposed to be any slides. What are we talking about? Slide decks, presentations, transparencies? It's the thing that you put in front of your friends, family, or more likely colleagues and prospective clients to get information from you to them. Or perhaps you didn't even want to inform anyone. There was just a meeting scheduled. You had to fill up your slots, so you chose to give a presentation. And presentations inevitably involve slides. PowerPoint and all of the copycat slideware friends out there, they are popular. Next slide, please. On the other hand, of course, there are the haters. PowerPoint has been subject to so much software shaming over the years. Some people, are you one of them, really, really dislike sitting through PowerPoint presentations. Presenters overfill their slides. They underfill them. They talk at them. They talk away from them. They source them with bullet points, GIFs and clip art. They end them too late or they end them too early. No, sorry, just kidding. That would never happen. PowerPoint is deemed to be so hellish that a couple of years ago, communications expert Angela Garber coined the phrase death by PowerPoint, which is a cruel, agonizing way to go. Now, over all of the years that I personally have been sitting through neatly bulleted slide decks, punctuated by the old obligatory cartoon, I always thought that whether a presentation works okay or not was just a matter of skill. People, they need to put in some effort, they need to choose nice picks, make sure everything is legible, avoid information overload. So I thought it really depends on the presenter whether a presentation works or not. That is, until I came across an article by statistician Edward Tuft from 2003, which is called The Cognitive Style of PowerPoint. Next slide, please. Now, in this piece, Tuft argues that it's not just what people do with PowerPoint that can have serious consequences. Think embarrassing stock photos, illegible fonts, enough bullet points to make any staunch hunter go ballistophobe. Now, what Tuft claims is that the problem goes deeper. It's not you. It's not your colleagues. It's not your well-meaning friends and acquaintances. It's the program. PowerPoint itself is the problem. Or at least, it's part of the problem. PowerPoint, they say, brings with it certain features that structurally prevent good communication. So PowerPoint is actively hurting presenters, audiences, and passers-by across the globe. Now this I find intriguing. So naturally I wonder, okay, what's the argument? For their article, Tuft says they analysed several thousands of slides. They did a couple of case studies. They looked at all kinds of instructions and guidebooks on how to make a good PowerPoint presentation. And what they say is that there is something called the cognitive style associated with PowerPoint. Now, cognitive style, that's a notion from psychology, and it just captures the way in which people think, perceive, or remember information. So it just has to do with information processing. Now, the claim that they're making is that PowerPoint, the program, imposes a certain way of cognitive information processing because of how it's built and organized. What then is the cognitive style that comes with PowerPoint, according to Tuft? Based on the study, they mention, and this is a very serious quote, the foreshortening of evidence and thought, low spatial resolution, a deeply hierarchical single path structure as the model for organizing every type of content, breaking up narrative and data into slides and minimal fragments, Rapid temporal sequencing of thin information rather than focused spatial analysis. Conspicuous decoration and froth. A preoccupation with format, not content. An attitude of commercialism that turns everything into a sales pitch. Ooh, okay, that sounds pretty serious. 
there's lots in that quote, but I would just like to pick three of the points which I think are legit. Can I have the next slide, please? The first feature, which I think is relevant, is the suggestion that PowerPod breaks up narrative and data into minimal fragments. Now, this is true. The basic unit of a PowerPoint presentation is the slide. And there's a good explanation for this. Historically, a slide was an actual physical thing that you would put in an actual physical projector. So you might have a full slide deck, which you'd show one slide at a time. The original developers of PowerPoint admit that PowerPoint, the program, was just designed to mimic this. Robert Gaskin, in the memoir from 2012 called Sweating Bullets, Notes About Inventing PowerPoint, says that they analysed many, many overhead transparencies and 35mm slides. And they crafted the program, PowerPoint, to look like what was already in use at the time. So yes, in the software and in these antiquated projectors, the basic unit information that you're confronted with, that you're looking at, is just one slide at a time. So yeah, it seems accurate to say that it's a structural feature of PowerPoint that whatever narrative you have, it gets broken up in exactly those units that fit into a single slide. So I think that this verdict that PowerPoint breaks up a narrative into minimal fragment, it's got to be true. A description of how it works or how it's organised. Next slide, please. Second feature I'd like to look at is the suggestion that PowerPoint limits evidence and thought. Well, yeah, obviously, this pretty much follows from the previous point. If the basic unit of information that you're looking at is the slide then per slide, you can only give as much information as fits on one slide. Now, Tuft says that of the thousands of examples that they studied, the average number of words at a single slide was just 40 words. And personally, I think today it might actually be less because people tend to go for these high-impact statements. Now, this is exactly what how-to books on how to give a good PowerPoint presentation recommend. Keep it simple. Don't overload people with information. No more than six items on a single slide. Now, of course, that is going to limit the amount of evidence and thought that you can put on a single page. Tuft complains about this because Tuft says that it results in empty slogans, imprecision, overgeneralizations. And I think what's crucial here is a comparison that they make. They say, take for example speaking. When people talk, they speak on average at a pace of 100 to 160 words per minute. That is already not a super efficient way of transferring information. But PowerPoint gets you on average only 40 words per slide, not even per minute, per slide. So Tuft says on this basis, the PowerPoint slide format has the worst signal noise ratio of any known method of communication. Ouch. Okay, let us look at feature number three. Next slide, please. Sequentiality of the PowerPoint slide deck. Sequentiality is just a fancy word for the idea that things come in a certain order. Here's the thought. If there is little information per slide... And if you do want to tell something of a story, then that means that you'll need many slides. And most likely, you'll be presenting these one after the other. Now, what Tuft points out is that in terms of information processing, this has consequences. Because it makes it quite difficult to assess the logical relations between all of these pieces of information. Pretty much out of the window go considerations such as what are the causal relations between this bit and that? What is the overall analysis or the argument? The main principle of organisation that we're left with is this and that, and then also that and that, one thing after another. And what is worse is what this means for the audience, namely the pace at which the presentation or the presenter is going through these snippets which is outside of the audience's control. 
In some cases, you have a presenter linger and they just go on and on and you just beg them to move on to the next point. In other cases, you're just jotting down this brilliant thought that you had and then the entire show has moved on five slides ahead and you completely lost track of everything that was going on. Tuft says, and I sort of agree with this, that this entire point of control of the pace of information transfer creates a dominance relation of the presenter over the audience, which hurts the audience's ability to control their own information uptake or control their own learning. These are three features of the so-called cognitive style of PowerPoint – breaking up the narrative, reducing the evidence, obscuring relations between snippets of information, these points can potentially be quite serious. And from this, you can see why Tuft thinks that this whole cognitive style of PowerPoint isn't just some neutral thing. What they say is, PowerPoint, it might seem appealing to you as a presenter because you got some prompts, you got some nice pictures on there, it all looks kind of professional. But do realize that this comes at a cost. You're harming content because the content gets distorted, dumbed down. You're harming audiences because it's limiting their ability to have proper information uptake. So all in all, it's just wasting everyone's time. Not because anything you did as a presenter, nothing you did wrong, but because of structural features of the program that you're using, namely PowerPoint. Now here's a quote from Edward Tuft to illustrate this whole thought. So what they say is, Imagine a widely used and expensive prescription drug that claimed to make us beautiful, but didn't. Instead, the drug had frequent serious side effects, making us stupid, degrading the quality and credibility of our communication, turning us into bores, wasting our colleagues' time. These side effects and the resulting unsatisfactory cost-benefit ratio would rightly lead to a worldwide product recall. Makes you think. Can I have uh, the next slide, please? As you may imagine, such a strong statement has attracted its share of critics. I want to draw attention to an especially forceful argument, which comes from Professor Steven Pinker, who's at Harvard University. And this was in an article in the Wall Street Journal from 2009. And I think it merits quoting. Professor Pinker says, Any general opposition to PowerPoint is just dumb. Whoa, well, yeah. I think it's really difficult to resist the power of this specific piece of reasoning. And I think I haven't seen that many people going down this argumentative line. More commonly, the way people reply is, surprisingly to me, a form of user blaming. They end up saying things such as, It's not PowerPoint that results in bad presentations. It's bad presenters. Or, You can't blame the software for bad outcomes. Now, even one of the original makers of PowerPoint, Robert Gaskin, whom I've already mentioned, even they take this line. In their memoir, they have a section titled, Is PowerPoint a problem or is it the users? And here in that section, Gaskin says that many people who make poor presentations are also so bad at writing that they wouldn't even try to write up any full detailed technical report or something similar. So they just don't have the information processing capacities. I'm not sure if this is like the latest thing in marketing, but to defend the superiority of your product by suggesting that its users are dimwits sounds sort of curious to me. And I also find it a curious thought, why couldn't you blame a tool for structural deficits or bad consequences? That's almost like saying, it's not the like button that causes social anxiety, it's how people use the like button. Or it's not notifications that make you grab your phone in the most awkward circumstances. It's how you use the notifications. Yeah, sure, if that's what you want to believe. I mean, think of it like this. If I get a flimsy record player that scratches my vinyl, then that record player is being a bad tool. It's causing damage. Then of course I'm going to blame the tool. So it seems to me pretty obvious that it's perfectly possible to say that some tools can be responsible for bad outcomes by design. That leaves us with the million yen question. If PowerPoint is indeed so bad, why do people use it? Why do people keep giving slide-supported presentations? Why do people keep tolerating and going to these talks? 
Now, I think here at this point, we could get some insight if we look at things historically. Cue massive throwback to 1987. Here's how PowerPoint was announced initially in a magazine called InfoWorld. PowerPoint is a program that lets users create and manage business presentations using overhead transparencies, flip charts, speakers' notes and handouts. The user works with an entire presentation at one time, eliminating the need to maintain an unwieldy assortment of individual drawings in separate files. Now that was the selling point. You've got a program to work with an entire presentation at one time, not an unwieldy collection of files. So basically what it offered to its users was a style sheet, editing tools that allowed for bulk editing, that allowed for uniformity. Now personally, I wasn't in business in the late 80s, but that sounds pretty convenient to me. It seems like it could save a lot of hassle. So I can completely see why people would want to jump on this program. But I also would like to point out that note in the announcement they reference to business users, business presentations. Edward Toft complains about this. They say that PowerPoint has an air of commercialism that turns everything into a sales pitch. Well, yeah, that should have been no secret. PowerPoint developer Robert Gaskin is quite explicit about this. In the memoir, they say, and here's a quote, PowerPoint was designed to make it as easy as possible to continue to make marketing and sales presentations in the exact style already in common use. PowerPoint's structure and design was based on how people in sales, in marketing, in the late 80s, did their presentations so that they would not need to change their ways. Now, I would say that... That background, that insight is crucial here. Because once you realize it's not you, or in any case, it's not only you, but PowerPoint. And once you realize that today's standards for presentations are modeled on what was all the rage in sales and marketing in the 1980s, then that opens up a massive space of liberty. Liberty, because if you are not now a 1980s marketing exec, and let's just be honest, few of us today are, then why would you let yourself be constrained by such practices? I think it is time to reclaim our freedom as audiences, as presenters, as friends, relatives and acquaintances of people who have to suffer through boring presentations, even as people who just happen to pass by an office window when someone is giving a talk. People still use offices. Something's got to be done. So let me sketch you a world. A world in which when you are giving a talk, it is okay to step back and think, hey, how do I actually want to communicate with this group of people on this particular occasion? Rather than automatically getting bogged down on the slideshare bandwagon. Where in such a talk, it is okay to draw type or doodle live on the spot, where it is okay to call up files, pics or browser tabs with or without bullet points, with or without clip art, a world in which it is okay even just to talk. Can you see that world? Next slide, please. Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of The Essay. For more essays, talks and vulnerability research, Stay tuned for fresh episodes from Vulnerable by Design, our parent program. You can also sign up to our email newsletter, The Vulnerability Letter. Head to vulnerablebydesign.net for more information. I'm Chris Omrust. Thanks for listening and bye for now. Mm-hmm.